it was not a difficult decision for me to decide to talk in English rather than French. If this was the, uh, the comedy Francais, it would have been appropriate for me to talk in French, but not in the Collège de France. Um, I want to, to, to carry on the, the, the subject that, that has been addressed extremely well by Jean-Jacques, but I, I want to, to look at slightly different aspects of it. And the topic is the origin of Homo, which you have, you have heard about, but I'm, what I want to, uh, to talk about is just what are we, what are we looking for? It's as well to think about that. And the, the work I'm going to talk about includes work from some of my students and students in our graduate program. This is a tree of, this is a tree. The, it, it is a metaphor for, for all living things, and all living things are on the surface of the tree of life. And this is modern humans in the form of Jean-Jacques Hublot, and these are our closest living relatives. So these creatures are all on the surface of the tree of life. Now there are three, um, when people talk about origins in relation to human evolution, they talk about three origins. The first is the origin of the whole of the hominin clay. And we have a reasonable idea from molecular evidence that that is somewhere between five and seven million years ago. And I'm not going to talk about that. The second origin is the origin of modern humans. And the, the fossil evidence and the molecular evidence would suggest that that occurred several hundred thousand years ago, at least a couple of hundred thousand years ago, and maybe as much as 400,000 years ago, according to the molecular evidence. The origins problem I want to talk about is a much messier one, which is the origin of the genus Homo. In other words, what, when did the, the, uh, the genus that, so that we are the living representative of, when did that um, um, genus arise? And basically, if you're like me at this time of night, if I'm sitting in a dark room, I go really fast asleep. So if you're just about to go fast asleep, basically the problem is, is the origin of the genus Homo down here, or is, it, or is the origin of the, the, or is the origin of the genus Homo there? Now you can go to sleep and I'll wake you up a little later and, and give you the answer. So what I want to do is to talk about these things. What is a genus and why do genera matter? Something about the history of the genus Homo, which will overlap with what Jean-Jacques has spoken about. He mentioned the date 1964 as the date of the publication which established the taxon, which is called Homo habilis. And so I just want to talk about what's happened since 1964. Then I want to talk about the factors that make it really difficult for us to address this problem and then ask whether we can do a better job than the job that we're doing at the moment. What is a genus and why do genera matter? Um, this is now a colleague of mine, Mark um, um, Collard, and when he was a graduate student, we wrote a paper in Science which looked at the origin of the genus Homo. And we defined a genus, not, this is not a, we didn't invent this, but we looked at various definitions and we 
and we, and we brought them all together and we suggested that a genus is a species or more than one species, which is called a monophyletic group, whose members all occupy a single adaptive zone. In other words, they make their living in more or less the same way. So the first part of the definition is that the species should belong to the same monophyletic group, and the, the word for that, the short word for that, is clade. So what is a clade? Well, it's all of the taxa, no more, and no less, that are descended from a recent common ancestor. Now, my students make fun of me because I like using um, metaphors to do with motor cars. So, um, a clade would be all Renault motor cars. From the original Renault all the way through to the most recent models. All Renaults are more closely related to another Renault than they are to another make of car, like a Citroën or a Ford, God forbid. And in theory, reconstructing clades should be relatively simple. Shared morphology means shared evolutionary history. That's why the Renaults are more closely related, because they sh share more morphology. If you look inside them, they look more similar than they do to another make of motor car. But there is a problem with this, and that problem is to do with homoplasy, which has already been touched on, and I'll come back to that later. The second part of the definition is to do with adaptive strategy. And to go back to my motor car metaphors, a grade would be like sport utility vehicles. No matter which company makes them, they all have large wheels, four-wheel drive, and they're high off the ground, and are normally driven in the middle of Paris by, by people who don't need them. But, but, but that's, so, so that's an example of a grade. Sports cars will be another example of a grade. Um, minibuses will be another example of a grade. So, um, so it's a group of taxa that shares a suite of functionally adaptive features like large wheels, large ground, um, high, um, good ground clearance, and four-wheel drive. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for, um, we're looking for a monophyletic group or a clade, and we're looking for a grade. In other words, we're looking for a change between Australopithecus or archaic hominins, whatever you want to call them, and later homo. We're looking for a gap where we can say that there is a shift in adaptive grain. And we're also looking for evidence of a group of hominins that are more closely related to modern humans than they are to any other hominins, such as Australopithecus africanus or Paranthropus robustus, any other early hominin. So what about the history of the genus homo? Well, Jean-Jacques has already gone through this, and basically, Homo was introduced by Linnaeus. Um, Homo was expanded, and the story of Homo is one of increasing inclusivity. In other words, as we have gone from the recognition of Homo habilis, what has happened is that the boundaries of Homo or the criteria for including taxon in homo, or, or a taxon in homo, have been relaxed. And the first relaxation, which allowed Neanderthals into homo, which until Neanderthals, the only species in homo was homo sapiens, the first relaxation was Neanderthal. 
The next was when a mandible found in the Mauer quarry near Heidelberg was included in, Heim in Homo as Homo heidelbergensis. The Mauer mandible is a, is a mandible which you will not find in any modern human. It doesn't have a chin. It's a large mandible. Um, so that was another relaxation of the criterion for including it material or a taxon in early Homo. Homo now included mandibles with no chin. The next relaxation was when material had been found in Africa and in the Far East, where the, uh, the crania were very craggy. They, were, they, were, um, they had brow ridges, not flat ones, but roundish ones, but they were not like modern humans. You would have to ride the metro in Paris week after week after week and then you would finally give up. That You would not see a modern human looking like this material which had been found in Africa and this material which had been found um, had been found in Indonesia. And then in 1944 uh, um, Ernst Meyer, who is a very distinguished evolutionary biologist, he suggested that the material that, uh, that Jean-Jacques had spoken about, Sinanthropus, and the material that had been, that had been included in, um, had been included in Pithecanthropus, should be included in Homo. Now that meant r relaxing the criteria for inclusion even further, because it because it is, um, this material involves specimens with really quite small cranial capacities, something in the high 700s and in the 800s. So that was another example where the criteria for including taxa in Homo were relaxed. But the most controversial relaxation was the one that Jean-Jacques has already referred to, which was the, inc the inclusion of Homo habilis into Homo. Now, with the enormous benefit of hindsight, some of the reasons that were used to include Homo habilis in Homo, we now realize were probably mistaken. In other words, they made the, the assumption because of uh, some minor morphology on the inside of the, um, the, the bones of the cranial vault that Homo habilis could speak. And they also assumed that it could make the tools that had been found at Olduvai. Now that may or may not be the case because it's very difficult to know which hominin made the stone artifacts that you find at the same time, even though circumstantial evidence would suggest that they might have done, but there is really no reason why Zinjanthropus boisei could not have done. So this is the most controversial relaxation, and that's why 1964 is a watershed. And this is the, these are the parietal bones that were recovered by Jonathan Leakey from an excavation that he was doing for his mother. His mother had found a saber-toothed tiger and, and Jonathan Leakey was working at Olduvai during the summer holidays and so his mother said, okay, you go and excavate where the saber-toothed tiger is and come and tell me what you find. And he did find something. He found these parietal bones and then he found this mandible. And John Jack has, expl um, has explained how the... The, the parietal bones and the mandible were very different from what had been found in southern Africa in specimens included in, in the genus Australopithecus. And the material was published by Lewis Leakey and Philip Tobias, along with a colleague of Tobias's who had been recommended to them because he knew about limb bones, because neither Lewis Leakey or Tobias really knew much about limb bones, but John Napier did. And one of the specimens was a fossil hand that you 
that you were shown by Jean-Jacques. And actually, John Napier was, a, was an extremely good magician. And he belonged to the magic circle. I'm sure there is a French equivalent of the magic circle. And so he, he understood hands. He, he was interested in hands. And he was the obvious person to look at the hand bones and the foot bones, which had been recovered at Olduvai. So, so how has this process of, of inclusivity affected the grade definition of homo? In other words, are these creatures all eating roughly the same sorts of things, moving around in roughly the same sort of way, and living in roughly the same sorts of habitats? Well, to go back to my motor cars, this is an American motor car. I thought I would be... Um, it's always difficult if you choose a particular make of, of car in a country because some people are very loyal to one make or another. So I decided to use an American make. So, I, so I'm not going to offend the people that, that always buy one or other make of car. So here is a Lincoln town car. It's a pretty swish, swish car. But if you look inside it, it's got front seats and back seats, and it has... Um, it has a couple of doors on either side, and it has what, what Americans call a trunk. And so it's a car. Okay. If you look inside it, it just looks like a car. By the time you get to including Sinanthropus and Pithecanthropus in Homo, you've sort of stretched the, the notion of Homo a little. Okay. But it's still, if you look inside this particular car, which I suspect... You, you are beginning to see in the streets of Paris when young people go to parties and they're the most extraordinary things, but nonetheless. Um, so we now have more windows, but nonetheless, if you look inside, there are still seats, just more of them. What Mark Collard and I suggested in the review in 1999 that by including Homo habilis in Homo, you had probably stretched it, in our view, a little too far. And if you look inside this particular automobile, there are not just seats. There, are, there is a television. There is a cocktail bar. There are fluorescent lights. Now, I don't know what your cars look like, but my car does not look like that. <laughs> so I'm suggesting to you that by including Homo habilis in Homo, the, 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 uh, the grade definition of a genus have been violated. The, the, if you look at the limb bones of Homo habilis, it looks, it looks different from the limb bones of Homo erectus and Homo gaster. If you look at uh, the size of the jaws, if you look at um, the relative size of the teeth, and you look at a whole lot of things, it seemed to Mark and I that Homo habilis had moved out of the grade of Homo erectus and Neanderthals. So what has happened since 1964? Um, there's more fossil evidence, and Jean-Jacques has already showed you some of this. There is fossil evidence from Olduvai. This, is, this does not look like a very promising specimen, and indeed it's not. I've seen the original in, in Dar es Salaam, and it looks as if you know, it, it belongs to a hominin that's been in a very bad road traffic accident. There are, there are lots... The good news is that there are lots of pieces of teeth the bad news is that they're all very small. And the good news is that there is a maxilla and there are pieces of the cranial vault, but they're all rather small. The importance of OH62 is that, it, that if you look at this maxilla, what that maxilla cannot be is the maxilla of, of OH5, of Zinjanthropus boisei. So therefore, unless you think that there is a third species in bed one and bed two at Olduvai, this specimen has to belong to Homo habilis. And its importance is that despite its very poor preservation, 
it links some diagnostic cranial material with limb bones, because otherwise all the other limb bones from Olduvai were all found in isolation, apart from a recent discovery by, by, by a Spanish-led led group last, that, was, um, that was published last year, which is an upper limb skeleton, with a, with a tooth which is diagnostic, not of Homo habilis, but of Zinjanthropus boisei. So we have an associated skeleton that we think almost certainly belongs to that extraordinary creature that Jean-Jacques showed you. And this, we think, despite its poor preservation, is a postcranial skeleton of Homo habilis. And then Jean-Jacques has already talked to you about the material found from Cubifora and the more recent discoveries from... Uh, from Kubi 4, and I don't need to go through that story again. But basically, since 1964, there is a lot more fossil evidence. The other thing that's happened since 1964 is that there are new methods of analysis. And the method, or the second of the criteria for, for including material in HOMO taxa in HOMO, which is the clade definition, in other words, the taxa are all should all belong to a monophyletic group or a clade. 1964, nobody was speaking about those sorts of things. This is because the methods that are used in what is called cladistic or phylogenetic analysis were only published in English um, by a Scandinavian scientist in 1966. So, since 1964, since the discovery of Homo habilis, this, the methodology for recovering clades as opposed to grades um, has been developed. Now, the, um, and it needed to be developed because in 1964, there were very few examples, and Olduvai was probably the only one where there was more than one type of hominin at the same time. And now we're in a situation where is, you know, if you take something like a million and a half years, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, um, six hominins. Now, some of these are in different parts of Africa, but nonetheless, once you get to a situation where you have several hominins living at the same time, you need a method for trying to work out how they're related. And that was just not needed before because the fossil record wasn't so good. Something else that's happened since 1964 is that there is now evidence for the hypothesis that I showed you in the form of a diagram that modern humans are more closely related to, uh, to chimpanzees and bonobos than chimpanzees and bonobos are to gorillas. Now that may, may offend you. My guess is that it, it's, it, it really puzzles the chimpanzees and, and the bonobos and the gorillas because the chimpanzees and the bonobos and the gorillas are in zoos yet two of them are more closely related to the people that go to the zoos than, than so, you know, my guess is that if you think it's weird, my guess is it's, it must be pretty weird for the gorillas and the, and the chimps and bonobos, but unfortunately I suspect they don't actually understand, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> and... Jean-Jacques mentioned Morris Goodman, who was one of the people who used molecular, not DNA, but the, but the morphology of molecules. In, in Morris's case, it was the morphology of albumin to work out the relationships between um, the great apes and modern humans. And he showed that modern humans and chimpanzees were indistinguishable using the assay, the, the test that he developed. And then, of course, 
once the, uh, the structure of DNA was worked out and it was realized that um, the DNA of modern humans and, and chimps and bonobos is, more, is, is about 98% similar. Now, you shouldn't be over-impressed by that because um, uh, if you consider a modern human and a banana, uh, we share about 40% of our DNA with a banana. Okay. So the 98% has to be seen through the lens of the 40% that you share with a banana. So it's impressive, but it's, but it's not quite as impressive as it looks. And we now know that there is something called incomplete lineage sorting, which means that not all of the DNA of a modern human is necessarily more similar to a chimp or a bonobo. Some of it is more similar to a gorilla, but overall, the DNA is more similar of a modern human is more similar to a, to a chimp or, or a bonobo. So um, in Mark Collard and I published a paper in, in 2000 where we were trying to validate this methodology called phylogenetic or cladistic analysis. And we reasoned that now we know in inverted commas, as much as you know anything in biology, that modern humans and chimps and bonobos are more closely related to each other than they are to gorillas, and that the African apes are, are more closely related among themselves than they are to the Asian apes. Um, we could use that information and we could pretend that the only thing we knew about these apes was the sort of fossil evidence that we had for early hominins. And so we made the measurements that we would make on the fossils on the apes with the distinct feeling that we would be able to validate the methods that we have been using. In other words, if um, uh, cladistics worked for hominins at the level of species, you should be able to recover the molecular relationships of the great apes if you made similar measurements that you were making on the fossils on the great apes. And much to our consternation, that wasn't what we found we found that when you use the methods that were generally being used to look at relationships in early hominins, not only did you not recover the, the relationships among the great apes, which were supported by the molecular evidence, but the relationships that you did recover, in other words, the wrong ones, seemed to be quite well supported. So this was not the result we were looking for. Now, our colleagues said, OK, well, um, there's no need for us to give up doing cladistics, because these guys didn't know what they were doing. They used the wrong measurements. They used the wrong outgroups. They did this wrong. They did that wrong. And they didn't use fossils, so they couldn't properly polarize the characters and so on and so on. The list of complaints was long. So we thought, OK, um, well, you know, we'll go off and we'll see if we can address some of, these, some of these criticisms. But we thought, well, let's look at some morphology for which there can never be any fossil evidence. And so we looked at muscles. We looked at muscle morphology, for which, as far as I know, there is no fossil evidence for early hominins and is never likely to be. And so we thought, OK, Rather than just assume that morphology, that, that you know, the problem is the way that we have done this, these analyses, let's look at a, a completely different area of morphology and see whether we can recover the molecular relationships. And so we looked at muscles, which are one of the 1,783 things listed in a sort of spare parts list for a modern human, which is called the terminal 
uh, the Terminologia Anatomica. It's a sort of list of spare parts. Um, and surprisingly, in 2000, when we looked at this, there were only 197 of those 1,783 for which we had information for modern humans, not surprising, for chimpanzees, for gorillas, and orangs. So even though this morphology had been out there you know, for people to look at by dissecting cadavers, uh, the, the information was only available for 197. So we looked at those, and then Rui Diogo, who is another student, we decided to go and get some, some reasonable quality, or we think it's good quality, but let me not, let's just say reasonable quality information by dissecting. This is a dissection of a gorilla. Looking at the morphology of the muscles of the head and neck and the upper limb and the thorax. And when we did that, we came up with 166 what we call characters. That's a technical term in cladistic analysis. How many bellies does a muscle have? Where is the muscle attached? Um, how, many, um, how many of the finger of the fingers does a forearm muscle go to? This is not rocket science. Okay, this is something that uh, Vesalius could have been, you know, could have done several hundred years ago. And this is the, the latest molecular tree of, of primates. Okay, you're not expected to know this, but just believe me, there are a whole bunch of large, large subgroups of living primates, and this is how they, they, they are related according to the molecular evidence. Much to our delight and surprise, actually, the 166 muscle characters from the upper limb, the head and neck, the upper limb, and the thorax recovered that molecular cladogram absolutely perfectly. So it wasn't a problem with morphology. Morphology can recover molecular relationships. It was somehow a problem with the morphology that we were using, which is the morphology we have to use because it's the morphology that's represented by the hominin fossil record. And you can see here um, that um, the orangs are here, uh, the African apes are here, the, the gorilla is here, and chimpanzee is, is there, and modern humans are there. Now, the, the, um, and this recovers this relationship which I showed you at the beginning. Now, to go back to the results, all you need to know is the difference between black and white. The black squares are unique differences. You don't find them anywhere else in the primates. Sometimes they are the addition of a muscle. Sometimes they are the loss of a muscle. So, you know, you would think that a modern human must have lots and lots of muscles in their hand. How could they possibly play the piano so well, or how could they do very delicate things? We have fewer muscles in our hand than a lizard. Okay. So, actually, one of the things that distinguishes us is losing muscles. We gain some muscles in the thumb, which is very important for us, but in the rest of the hand and the fingers, we actually lose muscles. And you can see how specialized the gibbons are. They're just extraordinarily specialized. So the, the black squares are unique. The white squares, even though they, they, they are useful in this, in this particular part of the, the cladogram of primates, they do occur in other in other parts of the primate cladogram. So they are examples of what Jean-Jacques referred to as homoplasy. And we'll come back to that. The really bad news was that if you look at those 166 characters and you just look at the ones that could possibly be reflected in the morphology of the hard tissues, if you look at that subset, in other words, you don't look at the facial muscles, which 
uh, which don't even attach to the bone. So they cannot have any signature in the, uh, in the fossil record. If you look at that subset, you actually recover Gorilla Homo, Gorilla Homo Pan, Gorilla Homo Pan Gibbons, and then Ponga. So it's not good news. Okay. So if you look at the 166 characters, you remove all those that couldn't possibly be reflected in the fossil record, you really do not get good news. So, so paleontologists must have done something very, very bad because the evidence that they have to use doesn't seem to be very good for reconstructing evolutionary history. And the other thing is that, that there are some, some assumptions that were made in 1964 and have been made since 1964 which we think are wrong. And, um, and so I've called these func functional capacity related studies. Things that look at a body size and shape, locomotion, cognition, dexterity and diet and life history. Let me just focus on, on cognition. Now this is, a, this is a figure from a textbook and you can see that um, the idea is that about 1.8 million years ago there was a an increase in cranial capacity. There was quite a sort of step up in cranial capacity. That notion um, was used by Iola, uh, was used by Leslie Iola, Leslie Iola, and Peter Wheeler when they looked at um, they looked at um, at endocranial volume in relation to diet. And it is, this is a reproduction in, in a paper from 2005. And you can see here, now it's called the genus Homo burst. Okay, there is a, there is a big increase in endocranial volume at the beginning of, of genus Homo. And here is, there is another burst at the time of the appearance of Homo sapiens. These are the raw data. And this is, um, this is a study that was it was done by a group of graduate students from our graduate program. So these are the, this is the raw data. These, this is mean log endocranial volume, and this is age. So basically, the suggestion is that there is, a, there is a, an event, there is an increase in brain size at 1.8 million years, which is an important, you know, it's an important event. You realize that once you start to put the error of the estimate of the brain of the endocranial volume and the error of the date in there, things look a little messier. And then what we did was not just look at this and decide whether there is a kink or not, because your eyes can, you know, can, uh, can play tricks with you. We looked at the data and said, is it best described by a random walk or gradualism or, or stasis and punctuated equilibrium or a combination of stasis and random walk or a combination of stasis and gradualism? And to cut a long story short, the punctuated equilibrium would be the expectation of the people who think there is a 1.8 increase in endocranial volume. Um, but this is just to show you that it was fancy stuff. It, but it was fancy stuff, not, not done by me, but done by the graduate students. Um, and you can see uh, that the, the punctuated model gets, gets absolutely no support from this. And the model that actually gets most support is the gradual model. So there is no, no event at 1.8 million years in endocranial volume. Uh, random walk gets a little support, but not as much as, as gradualism. So when properly quantified and all candidate modes are weighed equally, 
Gradualism is the dominant mode among the modes that we tested. And this pattern holds even when measurement and dating error are accounted for. And the proposed punctuation event in the evolution of hominin endocranial volume at 1.8 million years is just, there is no support for it. The other thing, the other bit of conventional wisdom was that at, at the time of appearance of Homo, there was a change in diet. There was a shift towards meat eating. But if you look at the latest data, and this is something that, it, that is being worked on now by David Patterson, who's, who is a graduate student in our program, you can see um, the red dots are homo. The blue dots are things like, uh, are creatures like Zinjanthropus boisei, like OH5, strange creature for which there's absolutely no living analog in primates. Uh, just a most weird creature. And this is a plot of stable isotopes. This is oxygen 18 and this is oxygen 13. And you can see that if you look at the fossils, which are found between a couple of million years ago and one and a half million years ago, there is a difference. The homo, uh, the, the homo values are over here. Um, the, um, the paranthropus values are here. And the paranthropus values are, are values that you would suggest would be the case for a creature that was essentially eating grass or something like that. Now you go to slightly later homo, and you look at the stable isotope values, and you see that Homo has now shifted over to the Paranthropus part of the world. And so basically, the most reasonable expectation is that these, that early Homo here, were eating much the same as the Australopiths were eating. And it's not until more recent Homo, in other words, something like Homo agaster or Homo erectus, that you see an isotope shift. And what we think is happening, or what David and his colleagues think, think is happening, is that this is a signal of meat eating, because these guys are not eating grass, but they are eating animals that were eating grass. Whereas these guys were not eating animals that were eating grass. So this was a shift not at 1.8 million years, but at one and a half million years. So it's yet again an example of sort of conventional wisdom, which it's very easy just to assume, oh yeah, everybody knows early Homo started eating meat at 1.8 million years. That was the reason that early Homo has a bigger brain and brain size increased at 1.8 million years. Everybody can go home and it all sounds wonderfully plausible. It's wonderfully plausible. The problem is that it doesn't fit the data. So it's a good story, but, but it doesn't fit the data. So can we do a better job? Especially, can we do a better job at this cladistic business? In other words, can we make a better job of trying to work out relationships among early hominin taxa? And um, so this part of it, and as I said, it should be easy. The more morphology you share, the more closely related you are. But as John Jack was saying, this man, Lancaster, who was a biologist in the 19th century, he wrote, when identical or nearly similar forces or environments act on two or more parts of an organism, the resulting correspondence is called forth in the several parts. Don't forget, this is the 19th century, the language is pretty fancy. Well, you know, I don't know what it was like in France at the time, but it's pretty fancy. Um, the resulting correspondence is called forth in the several parts in the two organisms will be nearly or exactly alike. In other words, if two organisms, if they're eating more or less the same sorts of things, despite having different evolutionary histories, they will end up, their morphology will end up converging on the same morphology, and that's homoplasy. In other words, it's shared morphology 
not inherited from the most recent common ancestor, homoplasy gives the impression that organisms are more closely related than they really are. Um, so that's just what I've said. Homoplasy refers to features shared by taxa that were not present in their most recent common ancestor. It gives the false impression that the two taxa are more closely related than they really are. So think of homoplasy as noise that obscures the phylogenetic signal. And basically, if you're interested in relationships, you're interested in the phylogenetic signal. That's not to say the noise isn't interesting. It's just that it's not interesting if you're trying to reconstruct phylogeny. Um, why do we think the hominin clade might be affected by homoplasy? Well, there are sort of technical reasons that, that things like um, uh, consistency indices suggest that um, um, probably about a third of the characters that we use in cladistic analyses are, are affected by homoplasy. Now, that's not as bad as half, but it's, you know, it's worse than sort of 10%. Uh, there is comparative evidence from, from primates and non-primate mammals. Remember the white squares in the, in the analysis. And if you, look at, if you look at the evolution of antelopes and elephants and monkeys and carnivores in Africa, there is a lot of evidence of homoplasy in these groups. And you must remember that when I was a student, I was taught that fossil apes from way down in the Miocene were ancestral to later uh, to, uh, to living apes because they shared morphology with them. We now know from the molecular evidence that something that's 15 or 16 or 17 million years old cannot be an ancestor of any living, living ape. And there is also good fossil evidence that, that that's not the case. So can we generate more reliable hypotheses about relationships? Is it possible to conduct more intelligent cladistic analyses? Yes, I think it is. And this is work of, of a student who actually worked um, with, uh, with John Jack and I. He started off with me, and then he moved over to Leipzig, and then he was a postdoc with, uh, with, with, with John Jack. And basically what Matt did was that he used micro CT to look at the internal morphology of teeth. And it's clear that from Matt's work that if you just score a tooth on the basis of the morphology of the outer enamel surface, you may be losing information which is occurring at the junction between the dentine and the enamel. And this this is all done using extremely elaborate methods, which many of which were pioneered in John Jack's department in Leipzig. And you can see here, this is, this is what's called the ridge curve, and this is the base curve, well, that's the ridge curve, and there is also a base curve. And basically, if you collect these sorts of data, you can sort things a lot more finely than you can if you don't collect those sorts of data. So if you just look at the length and the width of a tooth, and even if you take the width at a couple of places, you will never be able to sort M1s of from chimpanzees from M2s um, and M1s of another species of chimpanzee. You just cannot do that. So my feeling is that this sort of extremely detailed capturing of morphology using things like micro CT may enable us to, to develop characters that can be used for cladistic analyses, which are more intelligent characters than just taking the length of a tooth and the width of the tooth and, and multiplying the two things together. So what can we say about the origin of Homo? Um, you could say that it is something, you know, around sort of two and a half million years. You could say, if you don't like Habilis and Rudolf Ensis belonging to Homo, uh, that you could say that Homo originated at, at a couple of million years. 
And remember that each of these columns represents a hypothesis about the, um, the existence of a taxon and the ages of the, ex of the existing samples of that taxon. Now, I want to emphasize the existing samples of that taxon because, it, because if I had done this diagram for Homo habilis and, and Rudolf Ensis a couple of years ago, the heights of those columns will be different. Well, if they were different a couple of years ago, it's quite possible they're going to be different in two years' time and in four years' time or in five years' time. So you will be really unwise to, um, uh, to take those columns as, as really reliable statements about the beginnings and the ends of taxa, or at least the, the temporal beginnings and the temporal ends of taxa. So what can we say about the origin of Homo? Well, I've just given you a couple of examples. That's a different question from what should we say about the origin of Homo. And my feeling is that actually, um, with the data that we have, and, and John Jack was explaining that you know, we need more fossils, we need, we need more fossils because it will probably um, reveal more taxa, and we, and we need more information about the existing taxa. What should we say about the origin of Homo? Well, my advice is not much. Okay. <laughs> So I'm sorry, I mean, you've, you've, you've been extremely good and I've kept an eye on each of you, okay? And only three people's eyelids fluttered, okay? If it had been me, I would have gone fast asleep, so I congratulate you. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>